are all safe and dry. Tonight we have with us Bob Drongowski. He is a Northville resident. And I would say that a few years ago, Bob came to me with a handful of documents and photographs and he shared them with me. And he said, do you think anyone would be interested in seeing any of this stuff? And I very enthusiastically said, yes, yes, I, I think that's a good idea. So he's been working on this presentation for us. And tonight you get to see the product of all of his labor. And I'm very pleased that you've chosen to be with us tonight. And if you have any questions, you can either enter them in the chat and I will ask them at the end of the program, or you can request to be unmuted by raising your hand and we will let you ask Bob yourself questions. But without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, Bob, and it is all yours. Good evening. I would like to thank uh, Wendy Much and the Northville Library staff for assistance, encouragement, and preparing this presentation. Uh, I'd also like to thank all the participants for signing up and critiques by all are appreciated. Um, I started this project after my uh, father passed away in 2000. I knew from an early age that my dad was in New Caledonia during the war. Even now, when I see a map, I look for that island located roughly northeast of Australia and northwest of New Zealand. Talking to my dad over the years, I learned bits and pieces of life on Noumea and knew that he made chief rank. It was much later when my mom died in 1987 that I heard the name Il Nu. I was looking at my dad's pictures then and asked my dad who the men were. He, he only remembered one name, Bill Stiller from Troy, Michigan, which I wrote on the picture. The week before my dad died, we talked in more detail about his war experience, specifically Il Nu, the little island located in the harbor of Noumea, the capital of New Caledonia. Unfortunately, I did not conceive of what I would pursue years after he died. I decided to find Bill Stiller and tell him of my dad's passing. I remember he visited our home once in 1956. I located relatives of Bill who said he lived in Englewood, Florida. Coincidentally, in one of those ironies of life, I had taken my dad tarp tarpon fishing in Boca Grande, Florida, the April before his death in June. We had flown into Tampa, drove south to Boca Grande, and passed within three miles of Bill's house. After two years of correspondence, my wife and I visited Bill and his wife in 2002. In the interim, Bill had sent me pictures and told me about another sailor, Bill Turatelli, who lived in Chicago. Mr. Turatelli told me about Mr. Julian Perkins, Lebanon, Ohio, who gave me other names and talked with me many, many times. This age group didn't have cell phones, thus the phone numbers were still listed in the white pages. Then I hit gold when I located Ken Moffat, editor of the weekly based newspaper named Repair It. He had kept Repair It copies from the late 1943 until base closure in October 1945. Amongst other important information within these newspapers with, with <clears throat> if I could see where I am, amongst other important information uh, were the first, middle, and last names of men that were promoted. Therefore, my subsequent internet searches were made immeasurably more accurate. I met two Polish guys on a freeway outside Pittsburgh, PA. One guy from Toledo, Ohio, lived close to where I fish. Another came over to our house from Southfield, Michigan. The base bugler, Robert Langdon, corresponded frequently and related many memories to me regarding the base and the activities that men participated in. Many others, sometimes spouses, corresponded with me by phone, email, or regular mail. Again, I mentioned the base newspaper, which helped immensely in locating people and gave me insight into the daily lives of these men. I found them all over the country, from California to New York. Most corresponded multiple times. Thus, I have over 300 pictures of mainly ill new, but also new Maya and environs. I might add that it was illegal to take pictures of the base in wartime. Over the course of the war, the men engaged in fishing and hunting expeditions to supplement their mainly mutton diet, various sports including horseshoes, tennis, ping pong, football, baseball, basketball, volleyball, and boxing. They engaged in weekly dances, discussion groups, daily movies, band playing, educational courses, including algebra, geometry, trigonometry, slide rule, electrical, navigational, diesel, French, English, biology, American history, world history, modern news reporting, bookkeeping, shorthand accounting, business law, and economics. Other than a few bombs dropped from a spotter plane in early 1943 and one Japanese sub 
submarine that may have attempted to enter the harbor and was subsequently sunk, there was no actual fighting on New Caledonia. However, men died by accident, drowning, sickness, and over 250 by an ammunition ship exploding in the harbor in 1944. And except for the actions of a few brave souls, that event could have truly been catastrophic and killed thousands. My dad, left slide, my dad, uh, Anthony J. Tony Jungowski was born October 8th, 1921. He enlisted in the Navy July 20th, 1942. Since he was not yet 21, his mother had to sign release papers for him. My dad did basic training and advanced machinist training at Great Lakes, Chicago. He spent four to five months there and then was assigned to ship repair unit, Advanced Depot 40, SRU 8040. He traveled by train to San Francisco and then traveled in a ship convoy, first to Pearl Harbor and then to the island of Espiritu Santo and then on to New Caledonia, arriving March 21st, 1943. My dad told me he made the voyage on LST 449 pictured here, 41 days Frisco to New Mayo. My dad spoke of three events which he vividly remembered. One, Pearl Harbor. My dad witnessed the devastation which was evident even at that time, early February 43. Oklahoma was still upside down and destruction was evident everywhere. While traveling in the convoy from Espiritu Santo to New Mayo, uh, New Caledonia, a Japanese torpedo passed within 100 yards parallel to his ship. It was the captain's skill in turning and steering the vessel, which allowed me to be here uh, today and give this talk. Convoys were not allowed to stop and pick up survivors, even if there were any. And lastly, before arriving in New Mayo, New Caledonia, a, a, con a typhoon hit the convoy. The ship was rocking violently and the stack was in danger of taking on water. If that happened, the boilers would have failed and the ship would likely have floundered and rolled over. The lieutenant asked for a volunteer. My dad was one of the few sailors not violently sick. My dad and the lieutenant climbed up on either side of the stack and pulled a large top over the top opening and secured it with rope. My, told me that, my dad told me that is when he learned never to volunteer again for anything. New Caledonia was located northeast of uh, Australia and northwest of New Zealand. It is about 856 miles from uh, Guadalcanal and was, was, was within range of some Japanese planes. New Caledonia was 217 miles long by roughly 43 miles wide. Numea is the capital uh, located at the southeast corner of the island, has the only port on the island. Its harbor offered um, refuge to vessels of any size. The fight for Guadalcanal, August 8th, 42 through February 9th, 43 was won by us. This was significant because if the Japanese had won Guadalcanal, again, I likely wouldn't be here since New Caledonia was their next target. Admiral William Bull Halsey arrived at New Maya in October, 1942. On November 8th, 1942, South Pacific headquarters was established there. Halsey was named commander of U.S. Naval Forces South Pacific. Construction battalions were assigned to the area and over the next few months, construction rapidly increased. Uh, Noumea and environs became the most important base in the South Pacific. Of significance is the fact that the French did not allow Halsey headquarters on Noumea until late December, 1942. He remained on a ship in the harbor until then. This had implications at the end of the war for New Caledonia. Uh, briefly, New Caledonia was taken over as a French colony in 1853. Moving ahead, in the early days of World War II, France was overrun by Germany in 1940. There was an insurrection by the New Caledonians in August 1940. The Vichy French aligned with Germany and the Free French aligned with the Allies vied for control of New Caledonia. However, even the Free French, who ultimately won the New Caledonian struggle, did not take lightly the presence of American troops there. The relationship between the New Caledonians and the U.S. was strained throughout the war. Halsey left New Maya in June of 1944 to cheers from soldiers, sailors, and New Caledonians. New Maya, as indicated, was an important base throughout the war. Over 1 million GIs, 20,000 New Zealanders, and several thousand Australians traveled through New Maya. It was a lifeline between Hawaii, Espiritu Santo, and Australia. Oh, that's great. Excuse me, because my computer is slow. Okay, 
Ship repair unit Advanced Depot 40 at, at the Blue Arrow was located on Il Nu, as well as a seaplane base located at the Red Arrow. These were completely separate bases. Il Nu was 3.5 miles long, tip to tip, and three quarters of a mile at its widest. Uh, the inland bay at Noumea was protected by three submarine nets located in these areas. Uh, between Noumea and the island Nu is, is a channel three miles long by one mile wide, providing anchorage in any part with the advantage of complete security and facility of defense. One man from the seaplane base contacted me in 2004 after finding my dad's pictures on the internet. He was a radio operator at the seaplane base on Il Nu throughout the war and never knew my dad's base was right around the corner from where he was stationed. And this is a picture of the seaplane base. Uh, this is an overview shot of SRU 8040. In the right foreground um, located here are the docks uh, where the ships were repaired. Among the Quonset huts um, between the docks and the hill uh, overlooking the base were two machine shops, a pattern shop, a metal smith shop, an outside machinery repair shop, a foundry, internal combustion repair shop, and a drafting shop. All were needed to repair ships damaged in the war. To the left of the hill were the men's uh, living quarters located here, uh, chief's tents right here, uh, mess hall, recreation hall uh, in this area, um, cook's hut, sick Bay, movie theater, etc. Destroyers were the largest ships handled in the sick in, in the dry dock. Sorry, I couldn't find etc. Destroyers. <laughs> Left frame. This is an overview of the dock area from the top hill overlooking the base. Mr. Stiller is in the foreground. On the right is a modern day picture of that area. This is a picture I received uh, from a Mrs. Tiller of Christchurch, New Zealand. She wrote a book about her husband's service in the Royal New Zealand Air Force. Mr. Tiller serviced few storage tanks on many of the islands following Allied victories. The location of a Pan Am workshop and the uh, RNZAF Marine Section headquarters was identified. Uh, a few of the men who have sent copy of her book to did not know there had been a New Zealand contingent at SRU 8040 located at the Blue Arrow. The optical shop located uh, here on number 14 uh, from the hill located above the base. My dad, I'm sorry, my wife and I met veterans Joe Lakovich Le 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 and John Majewski at a rest area in a freeway outside of Pittsburgh, PA. Of note, these gentlemen had the only capacity to take colored pictures on Il Nu. Hence, I have some very fine colored pictures of the base and the area. The optical shop was the only building on the base that was air conditioned due to the nature of the precise work they did. Every man I talked to answered this question the same. How was it on Il Nu? Answer, hot. The optical hut was therefore a very popular shop uh, and stock for the men. Huts labeled 10 and 11 uh, with the machine shops that my dad ran. Number 12 is a foundry. Number thir 13, uh, the sheet metal shop. Uh, interior of building 10, the machine shop on the left. And this is interior shot of building 11, the machine shop on the right. This is the diesel motor generator set. 50 kilowatts of power was obtained from each unit. On the left frame, 90 degrees to the right of the hill overlooking the base towards the mirror are the men's living quarters, uh, the chief's tents up here, uh, uh, mess hall, sick bay, cook's barracks, rec hall, hut flag, flagpole and bell are located in ship's wheel are located in this, uh, in this area. Uh, right frame is a slightly different view showing the movie theater in relation to the um, uh, men's living quarters. These are, this is a colored pictures of those of those areas. The movie theater is here, uh, chief's tents, men's living quarters, uh, rec hall, and the buildings where they ate. Note the little house um, located at the Blue Arrow. During a typhoon in 1944, a few of the men sheltered there. This structure was still there in 2004.
Left side is a different view of men's huts and mess hall area from the back right. Right side is a uh, view approaching the movie theater. Chief's huts would be on the rise to the left of where this picture was taken. Left slide is a picture from the back right of the men's huts looking back towards the docks. Right side picture of docks from the south perspective, Numea is located uh, in the background here. Um, this is uh, the left side shows the large hill from where many pictures were taken. I mistakenly thought I could easily climb this hill and look out from where my dad shot the docks at Mr. Stiller in the foreground. Uh, the right slide is the picture of the a flagpole, ship's wheel, and bell. Many of the men had uh, uh, their pictures taken in this area. Okay. Uh, this is a close up of the movie screen and the comfortable reclining benches. Of note, they showed movies rain or shine. They had one projector, the movies had multiple reels. Thus, it was required to stop and change reels frequently during any given movie. The movie schedule around Christmas 1944 is shown on the right. For example, Don Amici starring in Something to Shout About had 10 reels. Directly across from SRU was a huge naval supply depot located at the Green Arrow. Um, clear view of the NSD. The NSD housed munitions of all types. Many ships came into the bay uh, to, to rearm. Two views of the large uh, Naval Supply Depot. And this is a picture of the uh, ship repair unit 8040 from the Naval Supply Depot. One can appreciate the size of the hill behind the base. This is a picture in 1943 of the SRU men taken at the movie theater. Lieutenant Jack Bartlett I identified himself. My dad is located uh, right here. And there are other men in this picture, which I, which I knew. Uh, Mr. Bartlett uh, uh, was there during the time my dad was stationed. He mentioned how they, this is a letter from him, they mentioned how they worked 24 seven preparing for the Philippines invasion for many weeks. However, they did break for movie nights, rain or shine, ponchos and pith helmets kept the rain off. Uh, the right slide is a uh, Walt Disney and designed insignias for all military branches, specific units and individual planes, ships, et cetera, during World War II. I was completely unaware of Disney's uh, making all these insignias during the course of the war. Um, Lieutenant Bartlett mentioned to me in a letter he thought that Disney made one for the base with Pluto carrying a broken destroyer in its mouth. I did contact uh, Disney Studios well over a year ago in an attempt to locate this insignia. Due to COVID, they said they would get back to me when things cleared. I emailed them a few times without luck due to the continued uh, pandemic. In the interim, I Googled World War II Disney insignia and was amazed at the thousands of designs that I located. Unfortunately, my search terms using Navy insignia, Pluto ship repair turned up plenty of insignia, but nothing specific to my dad's base. A week or so ago, I decided to search again using ship repair unit 8040, and lo and behold, Pluto popped up with a ship on a wagon carried by a wagon, the base hill in the background, and unbelievably the word ship repair AD 40. I never guessed that the search term would be such so highly specific to the actual base designation. Uh, left frame is uh, inside view of a typical Quonset hut housing the enlisted men. Right frame is an article in the base newspaper about Mr. Barnes going to sick bay for badly swollen eye from an insect bite during the night. South Pacific malaria and disease control urges all to use mosquito bombs morning and night. A tarantula was killed in a hut recently. Lastly, Dr. Johnson reports he has a supply, a supply of an effective, DD, <laughs> effective killer DDT, which anyone uh, can receive by calling sick bay. Left side is, is slowly coming up, hopefully. I apologize for this, computer is slow. Okay, left slide is Mr. Cottrell at his bunk ready, getting ready to go home. The right slide uh, is a notice that all Quonset huts received a thorough DDT spring to rid rats, insects, and skeeters, i.e. mosquitoes. <clears throat> left slide is Mr. Benath at his buck in his Quonset hut. Right slide is John Erminger at his trunk 
that is bunk within the Quonset hook. My dad, uh, right rear, Mr. Stiller is in front of him. Chuck Lucas is next to Bill Stiller. Um, when I zoomed in on my dad's hand, um, I noticed that uh, he had a beer bottle raised as if, to, as if to hit Bill on the head. Of note, my dad related to me an event that happened shortly after he arrived on Ill New. Two sailors were apparently drunk and were, dry, and were riding in a Jeep on the island. They didn't stop or went flying towards past security. They were shot through the head. Bodies were laid out on the dock and, and all the men were paraded in single file past these two dead sailors. The brass apparently wanted to emphasize the strict necessity of maintaining discipline and that we are at war. My dad arrived on Bill Noon, March 21st, 1943. He served there for 26 months, leaving the end of May, 1945 for San Diego and home for leave. He became a chief petty officer in January, 1944. Left frame, left my dad is on the beach. Um, Mr. Stiller taking a picture in the background. The middle frame, my dad top, top on top. Right frame, my dad in the doghouse. There were many guard dogs uh, located on the base. Left frame, my dad with pith helmet. This is the only picture I could find with anybody with a pith helmet on. Uh, right frame, uh, my dad left front, Julian Perkins and Bill Tiratelli are also uh, noted in this picture. My dad uh, on the left frame pretending to strike Mr. Stiller with an anchor. Apparently Bill did not clean my dad's tent properly. Rocky the deer is in the right background. This deer was found on the island, apparently orphaned and it was an adopted pet. It will be seen in many pictures. The right frame, my dad and Mr. Still are joking around, at least I think. Uh, left frame, my dad outside his tent with Rocky the deer. Uh, right frame, my dad on the rocks. Mr. Stiller can actually be seen in the background with a camera right there. My dad and Bill Turtelli outside my dad's tent uh, in both frames. Neither my dad nor Mr. Turatelli remembered the other person, even though they obviously knew each other well. This is Mr. Turatelli on the left and uh, giving Rocky a drink at my dad's tent. Uh, Bill Stiller is on the far left. My dad is on the far right. In this picture is a sailboat my dad and others used to sail around the harbor. Oftentimes, anchored ships would throw them food and ice cream. Bill Stiller is in the far left frame. Middle frame is uh, Mr. Julian Perkins on the left and Bill Turatelli on the right. And the right frame is Mr. Turatelli after a deer hunting trip on the mainland, i.e. Uh, New Caledonia. Mr. Perkins and Mr. Turatelli went on numerous hunting trips uh, on the mainland. Uh, Bill Stiller sitting on typhoon damage, uh, which occurred January 16th, 1944. Uh, both frames showed, showed uh, ship damage uh, post typhoon. Bill Stiller is on the far left uh, uh, with, a, with two guard dogs. Left frame is uh, Don Stewart, picture at the frag at the flagpole. Right frame is Bob Leggett, Don Stewart, and Chuck Hughes Lucas uh, on the deck of a ship. Left frame is Julian Perkins front washing clothes. Uh, right frame picture given to be my Mr. Perkins. Of note is this personal message to me. I knew them, but I can't remember the names. I believe Turatelli may know the names. Typical response for most of the men. They really knew their close friends' actual names and hometowns, but other coworkers only by nickname. Left frame, Mr. Donald uh, Penny, Lieutenant Penny. Mr. Penny said he didn't remember my dad, but relied on the chiefs heavily to stay updated on work, on uh, work progress. Right frame is a letter from Mr. Penny. At one time, I coached our bas basketball team and taught on a conning course in the in the uh, rec hall. Left frame, some of the command. Uh, some of the commanders 
uh, Dan Penny, top row, third from right to left, and Bob Langdon, the base Blue Girl, is located here. Mr. Penny is here. Uh, right frame is an article about Mr. Langdon playing four notes after taps each evening. When asked about the four notes, Mr. Langdon responded with a faraway look in his eyes. That's the four notes to good night, ladies. Left frame, uh, Bob Langdon's in the middle. Uh, right frame, a letter from Mr. Langdon to me referring to an article in the base newspaper. I get a kick out of the newsletter when it says Ensign Penny passed out clothes to whoever wanted them. Ha ha. He brought a 10 wheeler up to the flagpole and dumped all the clothes on the ground. It was a free for all, for all, and a lot of fun. I still have the Marine fatigue cap. Left frame, Ken Han is located here, is the SRU cook. He visited our house. He lived in Southfield, Michigan. Uh, right frame is Ken uh, underwent one month of advanced cook training on the mainland, i.e. New Caledonia. He returned to the SRU with certificates and diplomas proving in quotes, he knows how to cook. Left frame, Smith and Edwards in front of the Quonset hut. Right frame, Smith, top left, Edwards, bottom right, in front of the machine shop. Left frame, um, men posing in front of SRU Hill. Of note is a, excuse me. Um, Men posing in front of the SRU hill. Of note is Tiny um, McGraw, the biggest man on the base, far right front. It's Mr. McGraw right there. Uh, repair, repair its story on the right frame on how to arrange flowers to be sent to mom or the wife for Easter. The Florist Telegraph Delivery Association, International Headquarters, Detroit, Michigan. It'll make mom feel mighty good, the little woman too. Left frame, boys from Indiana. On the right frame is Carl Earhart from Louisiana. He kept a knife by his cot. One day, he and a big guy from Indiana got into a huge fight. No one picked on uh, Carl again. Uh, this is the crew from the optical shot. Again, co colored pictures and Quonset hut was air conditioned. Now, left frame picture of men in front of the Quonset hut number 14 with Rocky the deer. Right frame, sailor feeding uh, Rocky aside uh, the Quonset hut. Left frame is a sailor feeding Rocky the deer. The right frame is a notice that Rocky went to the waterfront docks overlooking the ships trying to figure out which one he would like likely to be on for, for duty. A large crane spun into action and the noise put Rocky into flight. He was a landlubber again before you could say deer, deer. <laughs> Left frame, Rocky the deer. Um, right frame, Mr. Dress. Uh, note regarding Rocky. The deer used to go to child line and muster with the men. Some of the guys gave got the deer drunk, not him, because enlisted guys only got six beers per week, two every other day. The chiefs sometimes gave them extra beer. They got us from Australia because they didn't like Australian beer. Of course, he was a torpedo man and they drank a torpedo juice, triple A 190 proof. This is a picture of Sam DeMarco on the left at the barbershop in the right flame. Right frame again is a picture at the flag grounds. Left frame is a Chuck McKinney and Lewis Klaus. The right flame frame is Charles Moore catching dinner on a fishing trawler. Left, left slide top, notice of, of fried fish obtained from two boats on a test fishing trip. Those who didn't get the fried fish had salmon patties, which I hated as a kid. Left slide, bottom, uh, Mr. Roach fishing off the docks landed two sea bass, 20 and 15 pounds. The far right, two ships fished for four hours and a total catch was one ton. Fished at 50, 50 phantoms, which is uh, 300 feet. However, each ship was out five and six days on a previous trip and hauled back five tons per ship. Left frame is uh, Chief Petty Officer Joe Comer on the far left. My dad was good friends with him. Right frame is an uh, example of a hunting party on the, on the mainland with a native guide. Left frame is Chuck Ears Lucas. Right frame is a Chuck on the left, Ed Hulfers on the right uh, near the Quonset huts. 
Um, left frame is uh, Ed Gabbert, uh, Ch Calvert Ivy, D. Blair, Chuck Lucas, and Hofers in the front. In the front, right frame is Gabbert, top left, Lucas, far right on the beach. Left frame is uh, Chuck Lucas on the left. On the right frame, Furman Hope met him in Toledo, Calvin Ivey from Utah, and Ed Gabbert, Upper Michigan. He was the illustrator for the base newspaper called Repair It. Um, <clears throat> bottom left is, is, uh, is, is Chuck Lucas on the bottom right. This is, uh, is the uh, softball team, 1944-45, Chuck Lucas, is located here on the left. Uh, right side, notice that 10 to 20,000 fans watched the Navy versus Army All-Star Baseball game. These were large events with uh, many people, uh, many fans watching. Uh, left frame is Skip Joe Lakowitz and John Majewski, left to right. Uh, met Joe and John on a Pittsburgh freeway. Right frame is Nick Vargo on the left and John Majewski on the right. Uh, left frame is Joe Lakowicz with Rocky. Right frame is Slim with Brown Dog. There were many pet dogs on the base. 69 is a men in the native hut. Chuck Lucas is on the far right. Left frame, Bob Leggett by the native hut. Right frame is the base uh, ambulance. It's a picture of the men repairing uh, ship bearings on the drive dock. Um, left side is the Harbor Patrol boat, Sally 3 at SRU dock. Two men are stick fighting. Uh, you can notice them here with uh, 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 long thin sticks. Mr. Red ha Harper was coxswain who took men from the SRU docks at the Navy landing at Numea on Sally 3, the patrol boat located there. He confirmed the stick fighting contest. Right frame is a uh, landing is the landing uh, uh, docks, Navy landing docks at Numea. Left frame is an example of a man being dunked. When eligible to return to the States, they are thrown into the drink at the docks. Right frame, uh, Joe Comer and my dad are listed in the base newspaper as having been chunked into the drink. Mr. Told me, he, Mr. Stiller told me he is one of the men who helped my dad into the water. Left side is an article about explosion of an ammunition ship at Numea docks. The USS Peridia arrived at the crowded docks at Numea November 1st, 1943 with the 93rd Seabees aboard. The munitions boat, the USS Cassiopeia, exploded at the docks, killing hundreds and wounding many more. These explosions went on for hours. The initial explosions rocked the USS Peridia and medical teams and, and supplies were dispatched to help the wounded. After the war, Many were, men were denied medical benefits and the men injured had listed non-combat uh, related conditions on their medical records. One man's e e email concerning this incident was heavily censored. This incident was classified until 1947. In Dave, Dave Friedrich's memoirs of the Casey, he described the horror and newspaper accounts of the explosion. Dave then heard from many victims and families who were finally able to verify the events which had happened. Some of my dad's photos on Red Harper's World War II website, which was financed and run by Dave, uh, uh, still exist. Mr. Harper ran the patrol boat between Il Nu and the New Mayor docks. The uh, right side is a picture of the explosion. And uh, here's other pictures of the explosion. On the right side, you can see examples of, of at least three fires in the far distance. That's over a mile away. Uh, where ordnance did explode. My dad remembered seeing this event easily uh, uh, from, the, from his base. Another interesting event concerning this explosion was the sinking of submarine I-17 off Noumea. One account, left slide, has it occurring August 19, 1943. The other slide on the right has it occurring November 19, 1943. I believe this is the correct um, a report initially it was thought that the submarine breached the nets and fired a torpedo, which caused the explosion at the Numea docks. It was later determined that improper handling of ordnance was the cause of the explosion. This uh, was the only known hostile action uh, near Numea during the war. Left slide is a story of Pat Finnegan working in the foundry. Molten metal splattered when poured into the mold 
seeping into his shoe and was burning his foot. He held on to the a ladle for about 40 seconds until help came to grab his end of the ladle, preventing further potential injury to others. On the right slide, again in the foundry, George Emmett escaped burning to death. Molten uh, metal splattered on his shirt, setting into fire. Mr. Gibson acted fast and ripped the shirt off the back of Mr. Uh, Amick, burning his hands in the process, but saving Mr. Amick. Last slide is a notice of an uh, officer's body was found uh, um, uh, floating face down near the docks. He was an officer from one of the ships in the har harbor. Left slide bottom is a note that Mr. Paulson was transferred back to the States after fracturing a leg after falling from a scaffold while working on a barge in the bay. The right slide is two SRU men were recommended for rescuing a new drowning victim in the bay. Bill Stiller told me of boarding a ship and having to scrape guts, brains, and human appendages from the interior spaces of the ship where men were killed prior to repairing damaged interiors. Mr. Perkins uh, similarly told me of working on a damaged ship and finding an arm white as snow with a razor in hand. That was it. No other remains, just an arm from a man who was shaving. All else was disintegrated. The sign in front of this house, the library says, men of all service, of all allied services welcome. I originally had this misidentified as the pink house. Of course, upon further examination, there is no line waiting to get in per our library host, uh, Wendy. This is the pink house. The pink house is a government sponsored house of ill repute. The French army purchased this house in May, 1940. They then leased it to Mademoiselle Benetier who operated it as a house of prostitution. With the arrival of American forces, December, 1942, Approximately 200 customers a day at $4 per customer was split 50-50 between uh, Mademoiselle Bentier and the pensioners. Although white American soldiers and sage sailors used the pink house, it was off limits to both officers and African Americans um, who also began arriving in force in 42 and 43. Also, what was interesting about the situation is the French and American attitudes about African American service personnel. There were reported incidents of black soldiers assuming, assaulting some of the local French women, the New Caledonians. Black soldiers were not allowed as stated above in the pink house. The French ridiculed Americans over this policy. However, the indigenous people on New Caledonia were Canucks, Melanesians. The French had no problem sub subduing these people in 1853 and they treated them as se second class citizens between now and present day. Although the Canucks did not have right to vote or to govern, they were inducted into the French army. There were discussions actually on setting up another house for the black soldiers using either Canuck women or negresses shipped from the United States. Uh, left slide is two Canuck soldiers. Um, these two guarded the general headquarters of the French governor. Canucks also guarded the prison located on El Nou, which was near the base. Uh, right slide is a note to me from Mr. Langan on how he used to take Japanese prisoners to clean the Quonset huts and the base. He states he guarded uh, 10 prisoners at a time. Interesting story about uh, John Vasquez, who, whose family moved from Mexico to the US in 1928. John studied to become an American citizen, but the war came and he enlisted. After two years on Il Nu without citizenship, Donald Penny uh, vouched for Mr. Vasquez and he and 10 others were granted American citizenship uh, on the island. Left slide is a football game on the parade grounds located on Noumea. As you can see, a sizable crowd was, was present. The right slide is a marching uh, Navy band uh, on the parade grounds. Uh, everyone knows this gentleman, or should, Bob Hope, obviously on the parade grounds in, uh, in Noumea. My dad was present at that. Uh, this is the US, US Army PX located at Noumea. It's post exchange, basically a general store for the servicemen. This is a picture of the Trade Winds Beer Garden in New Mayor, 1945. The government ran it. Beer was 10 cents a bottle. This is a left frame was the statue of downtown New Mayor, 1944. The right frame is the same statue shot by me in 2014. Uh, left slide is the SRU had a band playing boogie woogie and jive. Instruments were limited. One bass drum, one snare drum, 
one cornet, two violins, 1.5 saxophone. One had apparently no mouthpiece. Right slide is a uh, weekly dance notification, 70 to 75 girls from the mainland, 130 sailors limited. The left slide is noted big band leader Claude Thornhill, along with Jackie Cooper and other radio entertainers actually came to the SRU, not Numea. The right slide is another dance uh, notification, 130 men uh, limited to sign up. The left side notification of five dances on the mainland last Saturday and one dance on the rock, which is noted to be SRU. 20 to 25 girls were present, four times as many men. The indication is get your own girl next time is a suggestion. Right slide is a notica notification that if a man is going to the uh, mainland for a Red Cross dance, they must be off the streets by 2300 or they dealt, uh, or they deal with the shore re uh, patrol. And in regards to the shore, pa shore patrol, uh, Sing Sing, the brig or jail on Numea, it had a total of 1,157 jailbirds the past year. That averaged 3.2 men uh, being thrown in the brig per day. The left side slide, every Tuesday, a bingo game will be held. Beer, soft drinks, and fags, which back then were um, a term for cigarettes, for prizes. A uh, right slide is tennis rackets and base balls, ba baseball, basketball, volleyball, and footballs have uh, come to SRU. Left side, uh, cigarette Notice of cigarette rationing finally uh, spread from the U.S. to the South Pacific. July ration uh, was three cartons per man. August ration was four cartons per man. Right slide, notice of qubits, which again is uh, cigarettes. Shortage will not be a black market item. The left slide, movie schedule for the week of December 20th, 1944. Roy Rogers, Dale Evans, Claude Col Col Colbert, Joseph Cotton, some of the actors. As previously noted, there are multiple reels per movie. Therefore, the movie would stop, change reel, proceed, et cetera. Right slide is the uh, SRU had a library of many books. Of note, there were 17 new books that just arrived. Eisenhower, Man and Soldier, Invasion Driver, Diary, I believe by Richard Trigaski, The Wild Blue Yonder, Flighting Feats, Fleets, a few of the titles. Left slide, the top notice of uh, two-handed crank record machines and record supply um, for usage. Left slide bottom, notice of the next issue of field shoes to the SRU men and chits signed by division officers will be honored. First come, first serve. The right slide, notice that five large camera companies in the US plan to market still cameras using 16 millimeter film, uh, a low cost per negative. Um, notice, this is a report, uh, reported mission similar to what Mr. Perkins related to me. Two men were dropped by PBY, which is a patrol bomber, could land on water or land in the middle of nowhere. They took a rubber raft to a tiny atoll with canned goods supply for 48 hours. They serviced the instruments on this atoll. Excuse me, I just got goofed up a second. Six. Pardon me a second. Okay, they took a river raft to a tiny atoll and, and can't get supply for 48 hours. They serviced the instruments on this atoll and the phone and, and the plane returned two days later to uh, re retrieve them. Whatever type of instruments they serviced helped win the war. Typically, they did not know where they were or what they serviced. Left slide is a, a notice of tryouts for the Navy football team. Uh, the right slide is a notice of ping pong tournament to start soon. Christmas activities and dinner 1944. A dance Saturday 1223, religious activity Sunday 1224, general Christmas assembly, dinner, athletic events Monday 1225. Dinner included roast turkey, dressing, gravy, sweet potatoes, rolls, hot mince pie, fruit cake, and lastly, of course, cigarettes. Uh, note of a large number of fruit cakes which arrived at SRU. 
Uh, left side, Mr. Perkins was stationed on the USS California during repairs at the base, September 30th, 1944. Uh, early child voucher, fountain chip. Right slide is an issue of ice cream voucher, uh, ice cream made of canned milk, vanilla, no ice, on Fleet Recreational Center, Aor Island, New Hebrides. Uh, left slide is the uh, SRU Operation Center for Ships Undergoing Repair. The right slide is the ship at, at, uh, re at the docks for repair. Left slide is the fireboat dock that the Naval Supply Depot across from the SRU. The USS Vincennes, a cruiser commissioned in 1944 in the background, uh, likely, take, likely taking on munitions. The right slide is the USS Logan, an attack transport uh, in for repairs. Slide, uh, the next slide is a uh, war over announcement, 10 a.m. 8-17-1945. President Truman announced that Japanese accepted surrender terms. The men on SRU went wild. Ships blared, horns, men whooped and yelled, beer was distributed, chow was very loud as men banged knives, forks, spoons in their own cups. Tears welled up in the eyes of some, a half a case of beer per man at the canteen. The rest of the day off for men that could be spared. New mayor, jeeps, and other vehicles formed a parade with banners, flags, and toilet paper for decorative effects. The left slide. Nearly four years after a sneak attack at Pearl Harbor, the war in the Pacific has ended. Peace again reigns in the peaceful Pacific, and dictatorship again takes a downfall before the mighty power of democratic and freedom-loving nations. Before this sudden end to the war, military men of all branches asked if there would be another war. The consensus is yes. I think they were right. However, suppose we talk about more about spending for peace as we talked about during the war as spending for destruction. Suppose we appropriate billions for benefits to man, such as we appropriated on a gamble billions for the atomic bomb, to say nothing of the billions appropriated for all the other war needs. A right slide is the SRU discussion, discussion group, one of many, regarding the GI Bill of Rights. General opinion was that servicemen do not want to be shackled by any bill uh, that would make him take this job or else after they are discharged from service. Lack of interest in the future was due to men's confident, lack of confidence in those uh, that make these rules. Okay, this is uh, some articles, post-war pointers from the uh, Repair It newspaper. Um, and this is regarding chow time back home. Number one, if lamb to pie, that's a little woman, has served up a meal of lamb, be sure you do not explode and begin to call it all the names you have applied to all the Aussie and New Zealand lambs that have been, that have made up SRU meals. Personal note, I didn't even know lamb existed until after college. My dad would not allow it in the house as did many of the men I communicated with. They all hated mutton and supplemental, supplemented uh, meals with fish and hunting deer on, on Il Nu. As for fishing, Initially, my dad said they used grenades off the dock until someone was hurt, and then they ended that practice. Uh, number two, if you get beans and you are bound to get them at one time or another, eat them as if you relish them, but be careful to practice a little more self-control afterwards. Number three, if you have to pour your own joe, which is coffee, be careful not to let it go over more than one side of the cup at a time. If it goes over both sides, it will make one heck of a mess. Four, and if you do spill, do spill the joe, remember to apologize at once. Don't just laugh about it. Your kids might get the idea that it's a lot of fun. Number five, when you reach for a knife full of butter and the butter drops on the table, try to pick it up on the first jab. Do not play tag with it all over the table. Number six, if food falls to the floor, don't take one foot and grind it into the rug or hardwood. Number seven, when you reach for the sugar, be sure that your sleeve doesn't break everything out of Junior's plate. Better ask him to shove it your way. Number eight, when you serve little Junior, don't do like the mess order cooks did you. Put his salad in one spot on his plate, his meat portion in another, etc. Junior probably won't like salad covered pudding or cake or gravy splattered pie or ice cream, etc. Number nine, it was customary to give blessing at the table when you left home. Do not forget yourself after you've looked over the spread on the table and then let go with a lot of four letter words just because you don't like the menu she's prepared. Be thankful she prepared it anyway. Uh, number 10, when you sit down at the table, you may find a neatly folded piece of cloth beside your plate. That will be a napkin. Remember them? So do not forget and take the grease off your best pair of breeches or on a nice clean shirt front. Make the swipe with your napkin 
or your dungarees won't be happy or handy. 11, and don't forget this, you have at last got into the habit of taking your tray away from the table to clean it off. Don't forget to do this with your dishes unless you want to keep up the practice. She will get the idea that you have a job on your hands and you, don't, and, and you, did, not, you did not intend to um, when you went home. Um, this is post-war pointers on taking uh, family to the movies. One, be sure to leave your dog at home. You'll miss the dog fights when you sit at your first uh, stateside movie. Two, don't put your rain gear if it's a bright moonlit night. Chances are it won't rain from a clear night sky back home. Three, let the wife hold your cigarettes. You might light up in the show and bring a fire marshal down on your neck. Four, keep one hand over your lips. If you have to laugh loud and long, be careful not to say anything. You know what comes out over here sometimes when the scantily clad beauty parades across the screen. Number five, take off your hat, but be sure to take it with you when you leave. Number six, don't prop your big feet on the back in the seat in front of you. Number seven, be careful not to reach out and start petting the object next to you. It might be someone else's wife and the habit you formed at SRU of petting the dog sitting in the adjacent seat may get you in a jam. Number eight, when Bugs Bunny, Looney Tunes, or Walt Disney cartoons flash upon the screen, be sure you don't yell louder than the kids. It may be embarrassing if you outdo them. And this is a post-war pointers in the repair it on taking a bath. Let's suppose it's Saturday or your favorite bath day, or you can make it any day, like back home, and you are in the mood to remove dirt from your body. One. Don't forget yourself and start stripping out in the front or side yard. Remember that all undressing should be done indoors. At least that's the way it was before we left the US. Number two, remember that you have a wife and probably a little daughter. So do not start stripping at the kitchen or the side door and wind up nude in the middle of the house as you head for the bathroom. That was okay until noon. Uh, number three, when you enter the bathroom, don't forget to shut the door behind you. Uh, a visitor could come in while you're in the tub and spot a piece of your hide from some angle of an adjoining room. Number four, after you dried off, hang up the towel to dry. Don't drape it around your shoulders or about the loins and start promenading throughout the house with a blank stare on your face. Number five, leave your soap in the handy container on the side of the tub or whatever it is supposed to be uh, placed. Uh, don't pick it, don't take it with you to the bedroom or elsewhere and leave it where mom might step on it and take a slide. Number six, if you come up uh, absent-minded over here, don't forget you left the tub naked, so don't start right out of the house in that condition. It could offend your neighbors. Number seven, oh yes, that ring in the tub, tub it was custom when we left the states to wash it off when, when both was over, when the bath was over. That custom might still be in vogue when we return. Uh, left slide is a Lewis cloud dumping all into the ocean. As stated previously, early on in 1942, Halsey was kept on a ship in New Mary Harbor for months before the French allowed uh, the American presence on New Caledonia. The Free French and Beachy French sparred over the control of New Caledonia for months and also playing into the situation is the fact that Roosevelt and thus Truman did not agree with the French and British colonial rule. Therefore, at base closure, everything on the base was dumped into the ocean. New Jeeps, brand new engines, Quonset huts, electrical generators, everything was dumped. The place, the base was completely empty and swept and nothing but bare land uh, was left. Uh, again, these men are dumping all the electrical supplies into the ocean. Uh, left slide, this is John Lombardi and Bob Langdon, the base bugler, wrote how it took 30 days to get back to the States. They made every stop possible in the Pacific. However, they did make it home before BJ Day where every woman on the street was kissing every man in uniform. Right slide is a notice due to critical housing shortage on the West Coast, advised personnel being detached for demobilization not to have families meet them on arrival in the US. Um, left slide, this is a notice of separation centers established throughout the US. Personnel detached from overseas will be routed to their home separation centers via staging areas at Pearl Harbor, Guam, Saipan, Leyte, Hollandia, um, Manila, and Manus. Uh, discharges won't get liberty during their 72-hour processing stay at the separation center. A right slide is a notice that mums the word on discussing codes, ciphers, and classified equipment that help win the war. 
called uh, ALNAB number 257, one could go to jail for a long stretch if one discloses any such information, even after donning civvies, which, is, which are um, uh, civilian clothes. Uh, my dad uh, left the SRU June 1944, 45, excuse me, for 30 days leaving the States. He traveled home, then traveled to Industrial Commands, U.S. Naval Repair Base, San Diego, California, in July of 45 until December of 45. From there, he uh, went to Grant, Great Lakes, Chicago, where he started back in 1942 and was discharged uh, December 12, 12 uh, 2945. Total payment was $148.70, including $12.50 for travel. Last slide, my dad's honorable discharge notice from U.S. Naval Separation Center, Great Lakes, Illinois, 1229.45. My dad's picture upon discharge. Um, this company my dad worked for prior to entering the service, Hinkley uh, Myers, gave my uh, grandparents, or actually my dad, a service record book, which was to provide detailed record of all that happened during his service career. This personal history, favorite activities, sleeping and fishing. My dad was promoted to machinist mate third class prior to discharge from Great Lakes. Um, he left Great Lakes January 4th, 1943 by train to San Francisco for overseas duty. Of note, uh, my dad wrote, further movement in Frisco were mostly from bar to bar since whiskey at the inter international settlement was uh, too expensive. Um, and he left San Francisco on LST 449 for New Caledonia, stopped in Hawaii for six days en route, visited Waikiki Beach, did not see any hula girls as led to believe. It was a 41 day trip arrived uh, SRU 321-1943. Uh, 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 this is a Western Union telegram from Chicago to my mom-to-be sent 12-29-1945 at 1.12 p.m. advising Helen Burness uh, leaving Chicago, all my love, Tony. This is uh, my dad married my mom spring 1946. And uh, of course, we had, they had a big Polish wedding. I wasn't there yet. Uh, last slide, my dad worked at uh, Camp Moore, was Hingley Meyer initially, May 1941 to uh, 1959, where he became tool and die maker and he retired in uh, 1984. Right slide is my dad made this model P-38 Lightning on Il Nu in May of 43. This followed the Soroku Yamamoto, the man behind Pearl Harbor attack, being shot down by P-38 Lightnings in April 1943. Left to right, uh, my son, my dad, me, uh, my older sister, my daughter, and my younger sister. This is uh, Bill Stiller and Bill Stiller and his wife in 2002. And uh, this is uh, Bob Langdon. And uh, this is uh, Bob Langdon with his fishing buddies on, uh, on Long Island. And uh, this is uh, the French administration, local population, American presence in New Caledonia, 43. This is a detailed look at the house of prostitution and servicemen, sexual incidents, as well as labor shortages and implications of black market dealings, illegal liquor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I appreciate everyone's attention. Well, thank you very much. You jammed a whole lot of information into this last hour, sir. I have a question for you from an attendee. It's about the Quonset huts. Um, were they better than tents for inclement weather as they appear to be? Oh, uh, I, I, I believe that's true, but my dad really enjoyed the uh, tents because there was a lot, you know, there was only two people in a tent. So, uh, and in the Quonset hut, there was 20 at least, okay? So that perspective, you have much more privacy. Uh, and, and the tents were waterproof, I know, as long as you didn't touch them with your finger. Okay, and some of us are familiar with the movie South Hello? Uh, you froze, Wendy. Yes, Wendy froze up there for a moment. The question she was asking that is that people were familiar with this area from the movie South Pacific. Is there much similarity to 
that movie from the area you're describing for this? Uh, I don't remember South Pacific. I'm sure I saw it. Um, I, I, I really can't adequately answer that. I'd have to look at the, watch the movie again. Uh, but I, I know that uh, the French really distrusted the Americans, I can say that. And, uh, you know, they, they took over the people. You know, the Canucks were uh, ruled by the French. And, and I, there was uh, uh, some fighting there between the, the, the natives and the French in 1946 or 47 after the war uh, because they wanted their independence. And, uh, but, but I don't, I, I can't answer the, the, the specific question. All right. Does anyone else have any questions that they would like to share with Bob? Not seeing any other questions in the chat right now. And you can you can uh, uh, provide people e my email. You know, it's bobd at umich.edu. Uh, if anybody has, can email me if they feel free to. So again, that's bobd at umich.edu. Charlie Williams here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I uh, some similarities in there. My husband went in in September '43. He didn't do his last year of high school. Um, spent the whole time on Iwo Jima, went in on the second landing and they had, uh, we went to Hawaii one time and there were, uh, airplane hangars there that the CBs built and they're still there made from redwood. So they'll last forever. And there was something else you mentioned that was, oh, when he left, when they left service to come home, they had to go through those classes too. So they didn't come home swearing and <laughs> doing all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's a big one, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, and I do commend you for the program because you had a lot of information. Uh, you have a lot more pictures than I do. He passed, my husband passed away seven years ago, but, um, oh, he was uh, with the 133rd, but attached to the 4th Marine Division. On well, remarkable. Thank you, ma'am. And not a scratch. He came up, I guess, because he's an 18 year old kid and just very, very lucky. Yep. Well, very good. We're, we're, we're very happy for that. Thank you. Okie doke. Thank you again. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. It was a wonderful program. Did a great job. No, well, I didn't get goofed up. I did get goofed up a, a couple of times. The computer we is didn't. slow. And, you yeah, know, we I, didn't notice. Yeah, we, I guess we need something better there. All right, well, very good. Uh, so you'll get in touch with me in a few days or so, no big hurry. Um, send me the video or whatever, no, you know, again, no, no hurry. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Right, right, correct. Okay. Anybody else has any questions? I know that Frankie's asked to see your email in the chat, Bob. I didn't oh, hear no. the email address. Okay, the, okay, the email is Bob D, B O B D, at U M I C H dot E D U. Uh, Wendy has it also, but yeah. Uh, let's see. There we go. Awesome, thank you, Amy. All right, we don't have any more questions. Um, we can wrap it up tonight. And thank you very much, Bob, for doing all this with us and having a fantastic presentation. Oh, well, thank you very much for all your help. I don't think, I, actually, I know I couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> no question. <laughs> thank you, sir. Well, have a good evening. Be safe. Yeah, everybody have a great evening. Very good. Thank you.